Thank you all for joining. I'm so happy to see so many of you here. Um, we we're talking a little bit about exposing public API endpoints across microservices that live. Um, but if I had my druthers, I would much rather call this talk Anthem APIs with Left, which is very much in line with the new non mustache of brand. Um, so, uh, what are we talking about today? First, a little bit of introductions who I am, uh, where, how Lyft has started exposing public API endpoints in general, um, and what our infrastructure used to look like. Uh, then, I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, our infrastructure today, uh, which involves uh, some of the stuff. If, if y'all were in you know, this room or the room you was put down for, this is the other one for, uh, for Istio, uh, a lot of this might be familiar ground. I promise not to cover too much of it because, truthfully, I am not an expert at Envoy, but I think it's worth mentioning and talking about because it's a pretty cool piece of technology. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're going and some of the things that we're going to add and how we continue to approach it exposing public API endpoints uh, as a philosophy. So let's start. Um, so who am I? That's a sketch that um, uh, some folks at readme.io made for me when I spoke there, and I really love it, although I seem to have misplaced my hair and scarf, so it's too bad. But, uh, so my name is Josh Cincinnati. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Lyft. Uh, I joined uh, about four months ago. I've been doing developer advocacy for a little while. Um, prior to that, I was at a Bitcoin and Ethereum API company. So uh, if you all want to get crazy on cryptocurrency, uh, I actually talked to Montana earlier, and uh, I think he's probably bored with me talking about crypto at this point. So happy to bore any of you in the future about that as well. Um, but, but on to Lyft. Uh, so Lyft has been operating a public API uh, for a better part of a year and a half. Um, prior to that, of course, we had prior, uh, private APIs. Um, but APIs in general are pretty key to what Lyft is doing, not just for the native clients, um, like you know, but in general, um, I obviously, uh, as a developer advocate, love to see what developers build on our platform. And when you kind of look at the future of ride sharing and autonomous cars eventually, you can start to imagine that uh, API endpoints are, and the services that can be provided by developers building against autonomous vehicles is going to be a really large segment of the sort of business that we're going to do. So it's pretty key. I mean, to kind of misappropriate uh, something that you all have heard many times before, which is the software is eating the world. For you know, for me, it feels like if software is eating the world, then the APIs are the utensils, and uh, we're going to wind up being a big part of that. So uh, feel free to take that steal it, use it. I don't know. So. Uh, brief history, uh, Lyft's API started as a single piece uh, within a monolithic service. So uh, this is a screenshot of Lyft back when we weren't so pink, um, back when people seemed to sprint. Uh, for uh, small companies with a big monolith, um, it streamlines development and, and API usage. So it's very easy to understand how the pieces fit together. When you have a small service and how much going on, it's, 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 it's a lot easier. Um, so four years ago, this is what it looked like. Um, we had a private API that interacted with our native Android and iOS app, connected to the internet through uh, AWS uh, ELB, uh, and then we had our PHP and Apache monolith just connecting directly to the DB. And the, those private APIs, I'll mention, were definitely not ready to be exposed publicly because we were uh, really returning the state of the world. Which was easier and made a lot of sense at the time. But as you can imagine, when you start to expand to lots and lots and lots of clients um, engaging in many, 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 many kinds of calls, there's like a whole new idea. So, um, but it worked when we started. Uh, and so we experienced a little bit of hockey stick growth. And since we've been availing the public API, we've grown by 1,000 employees and have. 17 million rides a month by October 2016. Uh, sorry, I don't have a more recent figure, but I think that's the most recent public figure, so I didn't want to violate my NDA from third people. Um, so to manage that sort of growth and scaling pains, uh, we looked at the migrating to microservices. Um, and many of you may have seen, uh, we'll talk about this before, so this might be familiar ground, um, but I still think it's interesting uh, from, from a perspective of a large company that has this monolith to, uh, needs to move to something a little bit more. 
So the, the old way was actually good. And this is a picture of a typical five-star Lyft driver. And this is what was great about it. It was standard, I had standardized routing, rate limiting, off, uh, error handling. All that was handled by the monolith. And there was a lot of code we used. Uh, and everyone sort of knew what was going on. We have an engineering team of 20 that's so pretty easy. Um, if you can imagine, this is the monolith, several of the cars, the monolith several years later. This is what it feels like to try and decompose it. You just wind up going right back in and off the cliff. Um, but uh, in any event, the complexity for building against that monolith, uh, at least in our experience, has been uh, big O, n squared, the number of contributors, like some sort of bizarro Metcalf's law. Um, when you wind up having like um, that single piece of that single repo for standardization, uh, just code drift and API conflicts just become inevitable. Um, ditto with code merges and deploys, they became a massive headache. And uh, really, I mean, the worst part that anyone I'm sure has dealt with is that um, it becomes very, very hard to isolate certain uh, API problems. Um, so one bad thing happens in the API network, everybody else. So today, uh, our infrastructure is obviously more microservices based. Uh, those are not a new lift drive type. You can't order micro machines yet. Um, but uh, Envoy is what enabled us to do that. Um, so I'm going to actually take a brief aside before talking about what that public API, um, how we expose those endpoints. But we'll talk a little bit about Envoy. Um, so those of you who were at the Istio talk uh, yesterday, um, We'll remember that, that Envoy is Istio's sidecar of choice. Um, and for us, we've been using it for the better part of two years, and it's really made life so much better uh, at Lyft. Um, so the philosophy behind Envoy is the network should be transparent to applications, in this case, microservices. When network and application problems do occur, it should be easy to determine uh, the source of the problem. So it's big on observability and transparency. So I'm, I'm going to go over this very briefly because I also stole this from the Matt Klein, uh, the Lyft engineer who created Envoy. Um, and he's certainly much more of an expert than I am at this. Um, uh, I've only interacted with Envoy kind of on the, on the margins, but uh, it's, it's pretty cool tech. So Envoy is an out-of-process architecture. Um, let's just focus on doing hard stuff in Envoy and then just allow our developers who are building the actual services to focus on business logic elsewhere. So Envoy is a modern C++ code base. It's fast and productive. Um, it was, I think the decision to make it C++ was really based primarily on, on performance. Um, but there are a lot of nice things in C++ around uh, that make it easier to manage after it turns out just trying to place on C++. Um, so it's an L3, L4 filter architecture. It really is by proxy at this core. Uh, it's going to be used for lots of other things other than just HTTP um, and we do use it for other things. Um, and it has uh, it's also a filter architecture. It, it, it rather it's built that way, so it makes it easy to plug and play different functionality. And it was built with HTTP first in mind. So um, even though, uh, as I'll mention, not all of our publicly exposed endpoints and not all of our microservices actually use HTTP2 yet, um, they will be able to seamlessly upgrade uh, once once those services are ready and built transparent to Envoy, which is pretty cool. Uh, so anyway, lots of very cool features with Envoy. Um, observability and uh, some of the load balances was made even cooler by Istio, uh, if, if you all went to that talk yesterday. Um, so I would encourage you guys to check it out, just to do a little bit of shameless plug for both Envoy and, and Istio, uh, if you haven't already. A lot of what makes this possible as a result of Envoy uh, and we're really happy to have the contributions of folks like uh, Google, IBM, uh, Redshift, and the fact that Envoy is now a Kubernetes uh, compatible. <coughs> and so. All right, so let's get back to the actual API stuff. Um, this is what Lyft's infrastructure looks like today. So previously, you know, we had that one big monolith, and we only had uh, iOS and Android clients, and those clients still have private API access that allows them to do more things uh, that the public APIs don't, don't offer at the moment. Um, that's for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's easier for us to build new features on native clients that can be like, breaking uh, and we can move faster there, kind of work that out on the native side before migrating those to the public APIs. But we also have plenty of third-party developers, whether 
it's enterprise uh, folks like uh, we recently had a, I think a partnership with Delta where you can get loyalty points just for writing in lists, which is pretty cool. And that's built completely on public API endpoints, which is pretty neat. Um, so instead of uh, just having an AWS field, we have a front envoy, uh, and then each individual service has its own envoy sidecar, uh, of which there are many, many uh, dozens of different services. We still have a monolith because, as anyone uh, knows from trying to decompose a monolith, it's not just flip and switch, it takes a while. Uh, but many other services we have are, uh, we have a number of Ghost services, a number of Python services, uh, and then we're also migrating from one way to Dynamo in a lot of ways. Uh, and we have stats tracing as a, as a result of the monolith. So the real magic for exposing public endpoints happens in these services themselves. And I'm going to walk through like what what a request actually does when it hits Envoy and, and goes to one of these services and how we manage to expose it. So when you want to expose endpoints publicly, services, they should have their own APIs. So they, they do. They end up spinning up their, their own APIs and expose their endpoints themselves. But the big requirement here is for them to be consistent. So in order to do that, we, we kind of take key elements away from the services. So stuff like routing, labeling, and auth are their own service, uh, service layers. Um, and then we provide a standard library for each, each microservice uh, to leverage when exposing endpoints for common things like permissions, version management, um, and, uh, and then all of that is, is provided by that nice Envoy blanket uh, that makes it makes everything sort of transparent to the uh, services where they can just build as they like um, and and not really worry about the, the hassle of having it in So what does this actually look like when a request hits Envoy? So a request comes in. Envoy uh, looks through its interesting config file, which is uh, a little bit heavy, but uh, it's, it's, it's easier now to do this here. And it says, okay, well, I need to actually forward this uh, request onto the rate limit service. Rate limit looks at the endpoint itself and the IP and a bunch of the headers that Envoy supplies and says, is this uh, request, does it have to be rate limited now? If it does, then returns it to Envoy and says, you know, what's your idea? Um, but if not, uh, Envoy then takes that request and forwards it to our auth service that checks if the uh, request has the proper authorization uh, to be accepted as that endpoint. Um, if it does, uh, that's great, but we still can't go to the, the service yet because we need to check whether that authorized request uh, has to be rate limited or not. So we go back and we actually redo the request to the rate limit with the proper uh, auth headers. Once that's all good, Envoy actually does forward it along to the service. Um, and let's say if, it's, if you were using something like a ride service extracted for lib, um, then the request is forwarded along with all those headers included. So then after all of that logic happens on the Envoy side, um, those headers are sent transparently <laughs> to the service itself as just a regular regular request. Um, the permissions themselves are typically just a bitmap of the uh, permissions associated with the request. And then we, we have these neat little decorators that are supplied by the public API library uh, that all of these services use that uh, allow you to not even really think about the headers themselves, but in the library you're like, okay, well, can this request request uh, arrive? Just put that decorator in front of your uh, function and then you do all your write request stuff. So when that request gets formatted out, we have other uh, decorators that allow you to, again, abstract out a lot of the standard logic that you want to see. So in this case, um, you wind up having a catch error decorator that does everything that you need to send those errors back out on the future networks. So as I mentioned, those, those decorators are supplied by an internal API library, which uh, any with Python service can kind of make easily import. Uh, and the library also handles documentation via open API specs. Um, so the key thing here is that it is up to individual microservice owners to expose their endpoints um, and define permissions and rate limits, uh, and then also use that standard library that we offer 
um, to expand it for other other microservice <coughs> owners. So there's a fair bit of ownership around the services of Lyft, um, and it requires uh, a lot of people to be pretty proactive about what they're adding and contributing to the public library. Um, so this isn't true with the new roadmap. I just wanted to make sure that that came true. But, um, so uh, we don't quite have versioning uh, included with the public API library yet. If you were to get any of the with public APIs and still just have them run, but we're going to be implementing something akin to Stripe's date-based versioning uh, that will all be abstracted out into that public library. Um, the error handling is good, but could be better. Um, and as I mentioned, Envoy supports HTTP2 natively, uh, but not all individual services actually do that right out of the box. All the Go ones has to a certain version do, which is quite nice, um, and then that's just transparently exposed to Envoy. But for Python, it's more of a nice matter. The other thing that's really uh, it's really cool and what we're really looking forward to is um, IDL generation, so that we can be more specific about responses and requests and what, what people expect to get from those APIs. Um, and we're going to, you know, as a result, build like that documentation right into the workflow. So my dream as a developer advocate is to have dozens of SDKs in every possible language. Um, and that all those languages would be auto-generated by Swagger specs. And those specs themselves would be generated by everybody who owns each individual microservice. Um, and then you know we could also leverage what README, which our documentation provider, uh, our documentation provider has as an automated um, code and doc generation. So one day we will get there, but we're not quite there. Um, so uh, just a few takeaways. Um, it's really hard to do this right, especially after you grow from uh, a monolith. You need the right support technology. You need things like Envoy. You need to have uh, a shared API library. Um, and culture is just as important as technology. Um, so now being a team of many hundred engineers, it's great to have individual service owners, but you need all of them to contribute back to that shared library. And you need all of them to be thoughtful about the endpoints that they're exposing. Uh, at Lyft, we don't actually have a team whose job it is to truly manage the, the public API. Uh, we promote it as developer advocates and as head of the developer platform, but ultimately, um, it's up to folks that have ownership over those individual services to provide the rationale and to expose expose those endpoints. We can influence, but they're the product owners. Um, and then, you know, just lastly, for anyone who goes down the path of the line of single repo, repo uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Um, maybe it's more like a cute root or something, because you really should think about optimization path and tech and track your tech that early. Um, anyone who's had to decompose a model knows how hard it is and can be and will be forever and for all time. So um, the more that you can understand those compromises and choices that you're making early on, uh, the better served you're going to be um, later on. So um, that is it. Uh, that's all I, all I got. I'm sorry if I blazed through that. I talked fast. Um, but um, thank you so much for listening. And